pleased to present the CCA's J. Alexander Campbell Memorial Lecture. Um, the J. Alexander Campbell, a Campbell or a JAC research fund was initiated by the Canadian Celiac Association in the year 2000, and it's provided many hundreds of thousands of dollars in research funding on matters that are important uh, to us, of course, celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, the gluten-free diet. Dr. Heather Gallopo has been a recipient of funding from the CCA, and we're very excited to hear about her research today. Dr. Gallopo got her uh, PhD from McMaster University in 2015 and is currently a research associate and assistant director of the Axenic Notobiotic Unit. Dr. Gallopo's research focuses on mouse modeling and organoid modeling to investigate dietary antigen host immune interactions in chronic inflammatory diseases like celiac disease. Specifically, she's researching how bacteria affect host responses to the dietary trigger of celiac disease, gluten, and focusing on early events that trigger disease uh, development. Dr. Gallopo, I know we've spoken a few times before. It's great to see you again. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to share some of the uh, research that we've been doing in the lab. So I'll just share my screen. Okay, and every, uh, if you can see it all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction um, and the award. Um, so I'm a basic scientist working in a lab. Um, so like Mark said, I work with uh, mice, but not directly with humans. Um, but we always have the patients in mind when we're doing our research with really the ultimate goal of helping those with celiac disease. So I'm gonna to talk today about um, the work uh, that we've done in the lab with some mouse models and how they've really helped address um, some of uh, the um, unanswered questions in uh, celiac disease research. So I, I don't need to, to go too much into this because we've heard a lot about it today, um, but celiac disease really is an under-recognized problem. So it's a chronic lifelong disease that has um, intestinal and extra-intestinal manifestations as highlighted here in this picture. And because of this heter heterogeneity, uh, diagnosing the disease is not always easy. So there's often a lag between when somebody experiences uh, symptoms to when they're actually diagnosed. And as you are all well aware, a strict gluten-free diet is the only treatment. Um, but this is definitely not a cure. And there, like we've heard today, there's a lot of problems with the gluten-free diet. So it's expensive, it's hard to follow, and exposure to gluten is almost inevitable. And um, for those that have persistent symptoms or inflammation, there really is no other alternative right now. And so so this really has a negative uh, impact on the quality of life and severe long-term consequences. And so even though celiac disease is under-recognized, it, it has been studied for over 100 years, and we have made a lot of um, important milestones in terms of diagnosis, management, and pathogenesis that actually haven't really been reached in other GI diseases, like IBD, for example, that actually gets more funding than celiac disease. And so this a uh, timeline was taken from a recently published uh, review highlighting um, some of the gaps in celiac disease research. But, but what you can see is that, that we really have made some um, major milestones uh, in celiac disease research. Um, and so this includes the use of the gluten-free diet in 1940 to the discovery of tissue transglutaminase as the autoantigen, and this really helped with the diagnosis of disease. Um, but one of the more recent discoveries that uh, I'm going to talk to you about today is the development of animal models or mouse models as, as tools to study the disease and help answer some of these outstanding um, questions related to celiac disease. So, like I said, although we've made a lot of strides in celiac disease research, um, there is still a lot of work to do and several unmet needs. And this is really where models can help, like mouse models. And so celiac disease is, is complex. Um, 
even though we know the trigger, which is gluten, and we know that certain genes are needed. So this would be the, the presence of HLA DQ2 or DQ8. Um, there are still a lot of um, unsolved questions related to other cofactors that are involved, or that are involved. So this could be infections or certain bacteria that are present in our gut. Um, and so these are questions related to the initiation of the disease that we don't understand. And this is where models can help. So we can test some new hypotheses um, or, or new environmental triggers that, that we think might be involved. And as I mentioned, the gluten-free diet is not perfect. And we can use models to test um, therapies before they move into clinical trials. So these are quicker, more cost-effective than clinical trials, although before any treatment would be approved, we, we do need a clinical trial. The celiac disease research community is also relatively small um, compared to other GI diseases. But if we have these new and exciting models, this can attract new talent to celiac disease and help advocate for, uh, for more funding. And so for many years, like I said, we had no preclinical models to study celiac disease, but we do now, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. But the world doesn't really know about this. And even people who are in the celiac disease research community think that we don't have any good relevant animal models um, but we do. And so I'm going to share some of the work that we've done um, in the Verdue lab on the development of these models and how we've used them to help answer some of the unsolved questions related to celiac disease, but then also how we've used them to help develop and test some potential uh, novel treatments. And so one of the first things um, that I did as a graduate student when I started in Dr. Elena Verdue's lab was work on developing and characterizing this animal model. And so this was supported by um, an award from the CCA. And so we used mice that express one of the genes that are needed um, for the development of celiac disease. So these mice um, expressed the human DQ8 gene. So um, we now have mice that also express the DQ2 gene, but at this time I was working with the DQ8 expressing mice. And we expose these mice to gluten uh, orally with, with an inflammatory stimulus at the same time. And what we saw was that these mice developed moderate small intestinal damage, um, gluten-specific immune responses, and anti gliadin and anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies. So these are the same responses that are seen in, in patients and in, in humans with celiac disease. And this is actually what's used to diagnose the disease. And so it's also important to note that these mice just won't spontaneously develop these responses. Um, we need this inflammatory stimulus at the same time that we expose them to gluten. And the mice need to express these human um, celiac, celiac uh, genetic susceptibility genes. But this is actually similar to what's seen in humans, um, where we need a combination of genes we need exposure to gluten, and we need some other additional environmental factor to trigger the disease. Um, but we can take advantage of this type of model um, because we can now manipulate the gluten exposure or environmental factors um, to really study how this modifies these responses. And, and so in our lab, we're particularly interested in how gut microbes, so the bacteria that live in our gut, um, can influence the development of, of disease or the progression or the severity. And so during my PhD, and then even after until now, um, I've done a lot of work uh, using these animal models to see how specific gut microbes can influence disease susceptibility I'm just gonna summarize some of the key findings about what we've discovered about gut bacteria in celiac disease, but this is a very brief summary of these findings and it really spans about 10 years of work that not only myself has done, but other students and postdocs in the lab. So what we found was that um, what bacteria are present in the gut can really determine 
um, how susceptible our genetically predisposed mice are to gluten pathology. So for example, if certain pathogenic bacteria were present or were there in higher amounts, the mice had worse inflammation and small intestinal damage. And interestingly, these pathogenic bacteria are actually present in some patients with celiac disease. We also showed that certain enzymes that um, some bacteria can produce are also really important. So these, these enzymes can digest gluten, creating smaller gluten fragments that are either more or less able to stimulate an immune response. And some of these same enzymes are actually directly able to influence inflammation and inflammatory immune cells in our animal model. Um, but we also show that some bacteria can actually have beneficial effects. Um, so some bacteria can break down um, dietary products, so um, in addition, uh, like other than gluten, to produce um, molecules that are anti-inflammatory. And the presence of these bacteria in our animal model could actually reduce small intestinal um, inflammation. And so I'm gonna spend um, uh, some time at the end of my talk talking about this study in particular um, and how this pathway could be um, targeted as a potential therapy in uh, for celiac disease. So the studies that I, I, I just highlighted were all done in animal models but there's now these new and exciting approaches that are being developed to study all different kinds of diseases. And so this combines biology with a little bit of engineering to generate what we call organoids. So these are basically very uh, small organ-like structures that are grown in a Petri dish um, and from specialized stem cells. So this has been done in a number of other diseases including IBD um, with the colon, um, but we're working on developing, or I guess we have developed, um, a small intestinal organoid, or mini-gut as we sometimes call it, to study celiac disease. And so there are only a couple of research groups that are doing this in the world um, for celiac disease, and uh, we are one of them. So when we create a small intestinal organoid, or mini gut, it has to represent, you know, what the small intestine actually looks like and how it functions. And so the small intestine has these finger-like projections called villi and these crypt domains. Um, and as you probably know, the villi are what become flattened in celiac disease. And different types of cells uh, make up this lining of the small intestine to form the villi and the crypts. And these different cells all have different functions that are important to the small intestine. And together, these cells make up what we call the epithelium. And so in celiac disease, gluten that is eaten crosses the epithelium into our body where it initiates inflammation. Um, exactly how this happens isn't really fully understood. And so modeling the small intestine specifically um, can really help us answer this key question in celiac disease. And so I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on generally how we create these organoids and then how we use them to help answer this question. So to generate these organoids or small intestinal mini guts, we isolate specialized cells called stem cells. Um, we then grow them um, in specialized media in a culture dish and they eventually transform into these um, 3D structures that have villi-like and crypt-like features. What's also really important is that uh, these, these organoids also have all the different cells that make up the small intestine. So these are two really important features that traditional approaches to studying um, the gut lining have really lacked. And so, to generate these mini guts, we can isolate these stem cells from human biopsies. So this allows us to create these organoids from healthy individuals, from patients with celiac disease, or those who are on a gluten-free diet. Um, the organoids would then display the features of different human disease states, um, 
But for this, we do need biopsy material. And this isn't always easy to obtain, especially from, you know, someone who's healthy or on a gluten-free diet who isn't going to be regularly undergoing uh, an endoscopy. And so what we decided to do was create these organoids from our mice that um, express those human um, celiac risk genes, so the DQ2 or DQ8. Um, and so this is actually an example of an organoid that we have created in the lab. Um, so you're looking at it through a microscope and it's been stained with uh, different dyes. But that bright green color that kind of makes that scaffolding is showing um, the outline of the different cells making up the organoid. And so using uh, mice to generate these organoids means that it's a lot easier to obtain the small intestinal tissue. We can also um, control um, gluten exposure and environmental factors, so mimicking different disease phenotypes. However, these organoids are still not that physiological. So the structure is an enclosed sphere. You can't really readily access this middle part, which represents the area where we would be, you know, exposed to gluten or exposed to, say, your gut bacteria. And we know that the GI tract uh, is not enclosed. So, you know, we have an opening at the beginning and the end. So to get around this, we create what we call a monolayer. So in this scenario, um, we generate our 3D organoid, but then we actually disrupt it into the individual cells. Um, and then we reculture it on a flat surface in this specialized culture dish that has a top compartment and a bottom compartment. Then, so this is another picture of one of our monolayers. So you're, you're looking at it from the kind of a bird's eye view onto the monolayer. And again, the, the green is outlining the different cells that make up this monolayer. And so these, these monolayers still contain all the different cells that make up the small intestine, but now we can easily add other factors to the culture. So we can add things like bacteria to study, you know, how they interact with the epithelium. We can add gluten. And we can even add other cell types that are involved in celiac disease. So we can study their interaction. And so we wanted to use this model layer to, to help address one of the key questions in celiac disease about the epithelium and whether can it really initiate immune responses. And so we know that during established disease, gluten crosses our epithelium, gets into our body. It's then presented on these specialized immune cells. Um, it's, it's taken up and presented on the surface of these immune cells. And this activates these gluten-specific immune cells. And this is ultimately what leads to the inflammation and mucosal damage in celiac disease. Um, and and these, these gluten-specific immune cells really only get activated when they see gluten being presented. So that's important to understand. Um, but it's not well understood what happens during the early stages or initiation of disease and how gluten really initiates that inflammation. And so we hypothesized that the epithelium itself could actually present gluten to these immune cells. But this has actually never been shown so it's been hypothesized, but never shown experimentally. And so to answer this question, we again generated our, our 3D organoids, um, disrupted those organoids, recultured them uh, into this flat monolayer. We then isolated these gluten-specific immune cells um, to see um, to, again, these cells are, are only activated when they see gluten being presented by other cells. So then to our culture, we added gluten to the top compartment and then our immune cells to the bottom compartment and tested whether these immune cells in the bottom could be activated. And indeed, that is what we saw. So gluten was being presented by our, our, our epithelium to these underlying immune cells 
and they became activated. And so this is super exciting because this has never been shown before. And now that we know that this is happening at the level of the epithelium, there are certain drugs that actually target this interaction. And so this is something that could potentially be targeted therapeutically or preventatively. So I, I don't need to go into too much detail about this, about why we need additional treatments for celiac disease, because we've heard a lot about it today during the earlier talks. Um, but we know that there are a lot of challenges with the gluten-free diet. So uh, there, it's expensive. It's really hard to follow. Um, um, gluten exposure is, is almost inevitable, and it really does lead to an impaired quality of life. We also know that recovery is slow and not always complete on the gluten-free diet, and that many patients will continue to experience symptoms even though they are following a strict gluten-free diet. And so this um, uh, table um, highlights some of the current um, treatments that are in current uh, clinical trials. And so there really has been interest in the last few years on the development of, of adjuvant or, or alternative therapies. And so I, I did see some questions in the chat about, you know, what other treatments are there. So there's nothing approved yet, but there are drugs that, that are in current clinical trials. Um, and a lot of these um, uh, treatments were actually first tested in animal models and, and uh, in our lab, actually. And so lorazotide, which um, uh, I think Dr. Leffler talked a little bit about, um, that's probably the most advanced in terms of clinical trials, but it's thought to block intestinal permeability. And we actually show that it could reduce inflammation in our DQ8 uh, expressing mice. The TG2 inhibitor, so this trial was actually just published and it showed positive results. And again, we showed that, we, that it reduced inflammation in DQ8 expressing mice. And finally, there's the gluten binding polymer. So this is a molecule that would actually bind to gluten in the small intestine and actually prevent it from even getting into our body. And so we also showed that it could reduce inflammation in uh, DQ8 expressing mice. And uh, Dr. Leffler also talked about this, but a lot of these um, more advanced um, targets are being tested in patients who are on a gluten-free diet, but are having ongoing symptoms or inflammation. And so in the last part of my talk, um, I'm gonna talk um, about one study about tryptophan in celiac disease that you might have read about uh, in the news. Um, but this really started with a clinical observation that we made in patients with celiac disease. And then we moved into our animal model um, to, to further investigate. And we're now actually hoping to complete a clinical trial um, if we can get funding. So what is tryptophan? So it's an essential amino acid. So this means that it's not produced by our bodies. So we need to get it through our diet. And some high tryptophan containing foods include things like uh, vegetables like broccoli, turkey and chicken, uh, bananas, and even chocolate. And so once tryptophan um, or tryptophan containing foods are consumed, there are certain bacteria in our gut that break down tryptophan to produce these smaller molecules that are called indoles. And these actually have anti-inflammatory properties, so they're beneficial to us. And what we found using um, samples um, from people was that in a healthy individual, tryptophan is broken down by bacteria in the gut to produce lots of these indoles. However, in active celiac disease, this pathway seems to be impaired and there was less bacteria or less metabolism of tryptophan. So we had less of these indoles so less of these anti-inflammatory beneficial molecules. And in people who are on a gluten-free diet, we saw that this, this pathway was only partially restored. So we wanted to, to further explore this in our mouse model to see whether this pathway is indeed 
um, impaired, but importantly, whether we could potentially target it therapeutically. So again, we used our animal model that um, expressed um, the, the celiac risk gene, DQ8, and we exposed them to gluten with this inflammatory stimulus. Um, but we also exposed the mice to either a high tryptophan diet or to a strain of lactobacillus that we know is really good at breaking down tryptophan to produce these anti-inflammatory indoles. And what we saw is that both interventions actually improved small intestinal damage and inflammation in these mice, really suggesting that this pathway um, could be beneficial in celiac disease and could be targeted. And so that's exactly what we want to do um, in this clinical trial. So we've submitted a grant uh, to get funding to perform this. Um, we, we haven't heard back yet of whether we got the funding, but we are optimistic. Um, but we want to perform a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study to see whether tryptophan supplementation can lead to symptom improvement on people who are non-responsive to the gluten-free diet. So this means that we're going to be recruiting patients who have celiac disease and are on a gluten-free diet, but they have ongoing symptoms. And then participants would be randomized to one of two arms. So either tryptophan supplementation for six weeks or placebo for six weeks. And then at the end of the study, um, we'll look at whether there's any improvement in symptoms, but also in any small intestinal inflammation. Um, so we're really excited to do this study. Hopefully we get the funding, but if anyone thinks that they might be interested in participating, they can contact me um, at any time. Um, and so with that, um, that's the end of my talk. And thank you again for listening, for the invitation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gallup. Very interesting research. and. Uh... Yeah, fascinating that the talk of tryptophan. I, I mean, I associate getting sleepy with tryptophan, <laughs> but uh, there might be other other uses too. <laughs> yes. uh, so we 